I owe the uh, substance of what I'm going to talk to you about this morning to a question that came up a couple of years ago when I was um, meeting with the probation group in Rome about Janet Stewart. And I'm afraid I've forgotten the name. I know it was somebody from the US province, but I forget who it was, so I'm really sorry. But she asked a really good question about what influence on Janet's spiritual life might her, um, her Anglican upbringing have had. Um, the fact she was very closely involved with her father's sermons, for example, and looking up scripture passages. Um, this had struck this person very much. And I thought, yes, that's a very good point. Um, it's not something that is often, or has been much written about. So I had a go at trying to find out a little bit more about that. So that's what today's talk is trying to do. I've called it From Cottesmore to Catholicism. The alliteration pleased me. <laughs> um, but I'm beginning the story. So it's story time. In January 1879, with her Swiss maid Charlotte in attendance, Janet Stewart, aged 21, left the house in South Audley Street, where she was staying with her father and her sister Beatrice, and walked round the block to drink tea with Lady Mary Jane Kinnaird, who Maud Monaghan describes as the mother-in-law of the cousin with whom Janet and her family were staying. By the way, when I say Janet, next slide please, it's not because I have a mystical relationship <laughs> with our mother Stuart. Janet, is, Janet here, our Janet, is very kindly um, doing the, the job for me. So this slide, it, it, we, uh, Hilary and I went on a little walk around London to try and find some of these sites. And the, um, the actual house in South Audley Street, which Janet Stewart would have been apparently staying in, has been destroyed and is now a car park. But the houses, these are ha other houses that have, have survived, and so it would have looked like one of these. The maid, having made sure that Miss Janet's hat and coat was suitably disposed of, and that Miss Janet's hair was smooth behind, would have descended the back stairs to the kitchen, where, no doubt, she would have drunk tea with the cook and the chambermaid. Bit of upstairs, downstairs going on here. <laughs> the servants would have settled into enjoyable gossip. High on Charlotte's agenda would have been her recent alarming adventure in Miss Janet's wake of meeting a Catholic priest. A Jesuit, no less who had collected his hat from her in the passage at number 50 Curzon Street, the home of Miss Janet's Catholic friend, Harriet Ross. Charlotte particularly remembered and shivered at the memory, his piercing eyes that seemed to look right through you as he took his hat and, of course, glided like the well-oiled messenger of Satan that he was, <laughs> through the Mayfair shoppers on his way back to the Jesuit church at Farm Street, a short distance away. Charlotte loved her mistress, who was always kind, and she wouldn't hear a word spoken against her. But there was no doubting that Miss Janet did sometimes get notions, and once she got them into her head, there was no budging her. This notion of befriending Catholic priests had started after the death of poor Miss Stuart, that is Theodosia Stuart. Miss Janet had taken on so about that, it was a pity to see it. Miss Stuart, God rest her, would have been so grieved to think that her younger sister, whom she had brought up by hand, <laughs> it's a quote from Dickens, but never mind. <laughs> was not bearing up with fortitude and trust in God's providence, holding on to the faith in Jesus that the good canon had preached all his life. The cook tutted and remarked with some complacence that she thanked God daily for her staunch Protestant faith. If Calvin was good enough for her mistress, Lady Kinnaird, he was good enough for her. 
and Charlotte Noddy sipped her tea. Meanwhile, what was going on upstairs in the parlour? Maud Monaghan tells us this bit of the story, quoting Janet's own account. Lady Kinnaird had established Janet at a table, and Janet goes on, with a Bible between us, she chased me through it. She asked for text after text, reference after reference. Fortunately, I never hesitated, but was able to give all to her satisfaction. She shut the book with a sigh of relief. Well, my dear, it is impossible for a girl who knows her Bible as you do to go to Rome. <laughs> I replied, however, that I saw no alternative. Well, my dear, you will perish, she said, as she brought the interview to an end. Can we have the next slide, please? I think she has a lovely face, this person. <laughs> Old Lady Kinnaird, as Maud Monaghan describes her, was in fact only about 63 at the time this took place. Far from being merely the mother-in-law of the cousins with whom the Stuarts were staying, she was directly related to Janet twice over. And if you want to know how, you can ask me a coffee. <laughs> Why does this matter? It matters because Mary Jane Kinnaird was just one of a bevy of ancestors and relatives on Janet's mother's side of the family with whom the Stuarts were intimately connected on a day-to-day -day basis and who were remarkable philanthropists motivated by an earnest, energetic, evangelical spirituality. And I think this spirituality strongly influenced Janet even though she chose to become a Roman Catholic. It formed her only early notions of God on the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus and of her duty as a Christian woman. Although it was a tradition that for complex reasons she found did not nourish her soul and that she believed she had left behind her when she was received into the Catholic Church in 1879. It was, ironically, a tradition on which she drew, perhaps unconsciously, over and over again, when she spoke on matters of faith and the things of the Spirit with her communities. So it's worth exploring this evangelical tradition in more detail. In its religious outlook, Janet's mother's family was the product of almost a hundred years of revival movements within and on the fringes of the Church of England. The spirit of Protestantism constantly renewing itself through the intense preaching and ministry of the founders of Methodism, the Baptists, and many similar movements, all growing up from the grassroots often originally from within the Church of England. By the 1850s, the energetic impact of this revival to which some scholars partly attribute what they describe as the humanising of English social mores in the later 18th and early 19th centuries had waned. However, during the same period, in obituaries and other contemporary newspaper accounts, Religious culture of the Noel family was variously described as extreme or strong-minded, unconventional and devoted. So whatever the uh, overall culture, religious culture of the period was, was like, the Noels were hanging on there. The vehicles for its impact on Janet of her family's evangelical culture were threefold. First, the theology and spirituality as it was preached and lived by her father Sunday to Sunday in St. Nicholas's Church, Cottesmore. Secondly, the piety and personal example of her older sister Theodosia, which we glimpse through her correspondence with another of Janet's cousins, Victoria Noel. Thirdly, the example of her relatives, living and dead, in bearing witness to their faith through practical works of charity. 
Firstly, therefore, her father's sermons. A relative of Janet, who wrote to Maud Monaghan um, for, while she was collecting material for her biography, said that according to Beatrice, Janet had been called on as a child to make fair copies of the canon sermons, as she had a clear hand. And it was interesting, someone commented to me about the letters that we had in the exhibition at Roehampton, how easy they were to read, because Janet's handwriting was so clear. So she obviously had developed that very young. So Janet would have been closely acquainted with her father's sermons in this respect, as well as being expected to attend services at least twice each Sunday as a matter of course. A collection of his sermons, posthumously published, gives us a flavour of the message that Janet imbibed Sunday by Sunday, possibly half reluctantly, as of course one might want to resist preaching from a minister who happens also to be your parent. Maud Monaghan describes Canon Stewart as conscientious, upright, honourable, very charitable to the poor, and somewhat stern. His practical good works are not in question. Though a landowner of 90 acres of land which he farmed, he took his pastoral role very seriously. His obituary mentions in particular his ardent, I love that word in this context, his ardent and liberal patronage of education. And an inspection comment of the 1880s noted that the village school was maintained entirely from the rector's own pocket, long after the villagers were called on to contribute through public rates. <coughs> he held a weekly soup kitchen for the poor of the parish and regularly chaired meetings of the local General Friendly Society, which collected and administered charitable funds. He was also involved with the Missionary Society and other charitable organisations, and he restored his church, particularly the vestry, and putting in a form of central heating in the 1860s. And he built and renovated local almshouses for his parishioners. The obituary that appeared in the Oakham and Uppingham Journal after his death also commented, commented on his great inward and spiritual life. And it is this that we get glimpses of in his sermons. They indicate a man of deep faith, clear thought and strong principled ideas. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Family similarity. <laughs> Typically of evangelical Christianity at the time, his sermons focus on the sinfulness of mankind, but above all, and only, to push home the message of salvation. The passion and death of Christ is referred to over and over again as a redeeming act, and its efficacy for any individual is dependent on that individual realising it, making it real in themselves, letting it become active in their personal relationship with Christ. He writes, Our relationship with Christ should be of a friend and a brother. He deserves our love. And we answer his love by our love in return. These words are echoed quite closely in many of Janet's later reflections. In 1899, she wrote that she wished to abandon the role of being a pedagogue or a teacher in things of the spirit, in favour of living out a personal service of a personal saviour. And in later years, she wrote to her spiritual director, Alban Goodyear, about her efforts to imagine and sympathise with Christ in the Passion by trying to focus, unusually for the time, trying to focus on the suffering of a man rather than meditating on his divinity, in an attitude of silent companionship, as I should if a brother were broken down by trouble. Among the disciples that Andrew, student, uh, sorry, Andrew Stewart offered as an example of this friendship was Janet's favourite saint, Mary Madeline. 
According to the canon, she was an example of how we must learn to love him, love Christ, that is, before we can serve him aright. It was Mary Madeline who showed how loving service is happiness and was accepted by God even if no one else saw it. Mary Madeline, he said, had not counted the cost of the ointment she poured from the alabaster jar. Her only thought was pleasure at the thought of the value of the treasure she was pouring. The strongest emphasis is not on sin for Andrew Stewart, but on the love and mercy of God, freely given to each repenting soul. Ringing the changes on condemnation, he explained, in words close to Janet's in later years, does not lead to holiness. And it is holiness, in the sense of being like Christ, that should be the goal of all true Christians. It is only love and the sense of friendship with Christ and having a part in him, he said, that, was, that will suffice. Janet was to share a similar thought in 1901 with her friend and director, Father A. M. Daniel, at a time when she was struggling with a feeling of being out of her depth in her role as representative to the vicariates of Latin America for Mabel Digby. She wrote, Mary Madeline has helped me again. I don't know whether I'm right or whether it is presumptuous to think her relation with the Lord so intimate, so devoted, one of the beautiful friendships of his life is the type of what he wishes my inner life to be. Only Mary Madeline understands silently Jesus' anguish in the days leading up to the crucifixion. Janet continues, she had to do something for him to give expression to it. She sought the most precious thing she had and she poured it over him. He understood and she, no one else. So the soul to Christ, my soul. Throughout her religious life, Janet longs to make this intimate, secret even, friendship the mainspring of her life sitting at Christ's feet, peaceful, humble, attentive, as she said, so that in her ministry to others, it might be his sympathy, not merely hers, that they experience. Next slide, please. Each of Canon Stewart's sermons is carefully thought through and flows with a logical structure and cogent development of ideas. The ideas presented in his sermons are, it has to be admitted, very predictable. Each sermon is different and well crafted, but presents one with the same message. His faith appeared unshaken by the multitude of deaths he had experienced in his own family. You remember all those names on the tomb in the um, graveyard. Or by the suffering of the poor villagers he lived among and charitably served. Perhaps it was this apparent imperturbability that the teenage Janet was impatient with when she told Lady Kinnaird there is no alternative and when she shrugged off William Gladstone's kindly exhortations to avoid Rome, for it was not the fate of free English people and it would limit her intellectual independence. Janet was conventional enough to want to live with a religious faith, many chose not to at this time. She was honest enough to see there was plenty of evidence all around her to make it of unsure foundation. But nevertheless, she was anxious enough as a person that her faith should rest on certainty and not on the inherited say-so of her exemplary father. And for her, in 1879, certainty appeared to reside in the Catholic Church. The calm, rational prose of each of uh, her father's homilies is structured by a rhetorical device that highlights their evangelical intention. Each presents his listeners with a choice to make in the present moment, the here and now. The congregation must decide between two alternatives. 
they always boil down to Satan or Christ. Of course, Ignatius does exactly the same thing. <laughs> Misery now, leading to true happiness, versus apparent happiness now that would lead to real misery later. That's what it boils down to. He gives an example of the happiness of a businessman reliant on the uncertain performance of the stock market, or the happiness of a Christian reliant on the providence of God. It's a very traditional device. Shakespeare has Hamlet use it to try and effect a moral conversion in his mother Gertrude. What's the relevance of Shakespeare? It just occurred to me that Ich kann nicht mehr, which is her last, her last words, in, which were in German, is an actual, it's a German translation of what Hamlet says as he dies. So useless information, but I like that kind of thing. <laughs> Janet herself uses this same device of choice between good and evil in some of her conferences. For example, to the community in Tokyo in 1914, contrasting a picture of the state of the world that does not acknowledge the incarnation with the state of what is going on between God and Mary at the Annunciation. And she's inviting the sisters to join the latter, not the former. In reasonable, non-emotive language, one certainly doesn't get the sense of a Billy Graham or a Pentecostalist speaker whipping up the emotions of his flock. Canon Stuart's parishioners were being presented with the possibility of a conversion from the Christian faith as what everyone does, to Christian faith as what I do in response to an experience of God's grace. This would be an acceptable evangelical conversion. <coughs> Canon Stewart would not have intended that any of his hearers would find themselves responding to God's personal invitation by a choice of a different form of Christianity altogether. Yet in very recent memory, three key members of his family had undergone exactly such a conversion. And so Janet's own conversion in 1879 was in a way just the latest in a family tradition of taking religion seriously. Next slide, please. His wife's uncle, Baptist Risley Noel, was the most famous or infamous of these converts, depending on your point of view. He was a well-known and highly popular Anglican preacher whose voice was described as silver-toned and melodious and whose sudden conversion to the Baptist Church in 1848, it is said, caused almost as much of a stir in the Church of England as John Henry Newman's had when he converted to Catholicism three years earlier. And actually, both of those conversions were over the same sorts of controversy. They were just taking different sides of the arguments. I, actually, I think he looks very like Janet, this uncle of hers, this great uncle of hers. The conversion was cost, uh, sorry, the second convert among the Janet's immediate family was her mother's cousin, the second Earl of Gainsborough, next slide please, nephew of Baptist, these are rather idealised statues or busts that are in the chapel at the stately home of Exton, which some of you were able to visit last year, of the um, Janet's great uncle at the time of his marriage, so just before he became a Catholic. Um, this second Earl of Gainsborough, nephew of Baptist, whom a contemporary newspaper reports as having converted to Romanism from extreme evangelicalism in 1851, the conversion was costly to the Earl in terms of his social and political prestige. As a Catholic, he was unable to present the livings of all the churches and the church property he owned in Kent, Rutland and Gloucestershire. No longer were there country vicars and rectors to be appointments of his family. Instead, they reverted back to the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. And I suspect the income did too, though I, I don't know that for sure. 
His evangelical spirit, however, lived on after his conversion, as he and his convert wife worked hard to turn the village of Exton into a Catholic village. A Catholic school was built, a Catholic chapel um, adjoining the, the stately home, a Catholic church in Oakham itself. Catholic retreats were preached in Oakham and in Exton, and indulgences were given. At the consecration service for the Exton Chapel in 1869, it was Cardinal Manning, no less, thank you, who preached. He himself was a, was a convert. Archbishop Ullathorne of Birmingham celebrated and other assorted clergy were in attendance. Manning had started life as an evangelical and his preaching style owed a good deal to that tradition. In words that would, have, that would have made sense later to Janet, Manning took as his inspiration the example of St. Thomas of Canterbury, St. Thomas of Becket, after whom the chapel here was named, and on whose feast day the service was being held. Thomas of Canterbury was an example, according to Manning, of the liberties of church over against the state and the need to choose between unbelief and rationalism on the one hand and a return to the faith of St. Thomas on the other. According to the Lincolnshire Chronicle, which published the entire sermon, it riveted the congregation for three quarters of an hour. The assembled congregation included many Protestants from neighbouring villages, including Cottesmore, though not, of course, Canon Stewart's family. So much for one kind of conversion, the dramatic and one-off turning of a soul from one way of life towards another in response to some overwhelming experience of God. Another typical evangelical message is ongoing progressive ethical conversion. In Canon Stewart's homilies, life is presented as a school like poor scholars, he says, we come to Christ as we are, and Christ, the good schoolmaster, makes us what we ought to be. Janet echoes the sentiment. She says, we should take our soul as our first and favourite pupil and give it every advantage we can. And developing the idea of God as a patient teacher, she wrote to, um, to somebody she was counselling, each year he turns over a new page for us, and we have a picture to study and a page to read. And at the end he says, have you understood? And if you can say yes, then he turns over another with great pleasure at having such a willing and apt scholar. This schoolmaster or schoolmistress metaphor is, of course, not one that was confined to evangelical preaching, but it was from her father, the minister, that Janet heard it first. Now, it would be far too much of an oversimplification to say that Janet's spirituality as an RSCJ was simply the product of her father's. Of course not. Her conferences are strongly marked by St. Ignatius, by a devotion to Our Lady, who never appears in her father's sermons, or the published ones at any rate. It is also marked, of course, by the spirituality of the society and of the Sacred Heart. Janet, hungry for something more than what she had been fed with from birth, found the more in Catholicism and later in the society. But she also rediscovered there the message she had apparently left behind her as a 20-year-old. Her conferences and letters are littered with reflections and illusions that would have rejoiced the heart of her father. Above all, the emphasis on God's merciful love and on friendship with Christ, on the spiritual and moral training given by lessons in life. She shares with her father a strong emphasis on looking forward to the life to come. This is a primary motive for all one's efforts to live in response to God, in Jesus, in the here and now. Imagery about the life to come 
imbues her homilies and her letters and her conferences over and over again, images such as ships coming into port, the spirit seeking life and beauty, a life and beauty that will only be clear to it after death. This was very typical of the Victorian period. Monaghan's own account of Janet's death owes much to the tradition of visionary last moments that pervade the deaths of the innocent and the good in Victorian literature, as well, of course, as much older hagiographical tradition. Again, I would just say that it was from her father that Janet heard these sentiments first. Unusually for a Catholic of her generation, too, her conferences and personal notes are rooted in a deep and detailed knowledge of the scriptures, the study of which, said Andrew Stewart, was the best protection from vagueness, which was a pet hate all her life of Janet's, in the effort to live a Christian life. Janet does not emphasize the importance of conversion in her work, but, and it comes to the same thing, she does over and over again emphasize the need for fervency in faith, another form of conversion of heart, as her father would have agreed. Move the next slide. Another strong influence within the family on Janet's spirituality was that of her eldest half-sister, Theodosia, who was instrumental in bringing her up after the death of Penelope, Janet's mother, and Theodosia's stepmother. Theodosia, a correspondent to Maud Monaghan, wrote in 1915, was the closest of his children to Canon Stewart until she became an invalid from TB. We glimpse Theodosia's spirituality and character in the letters between her and Victoria Noel, the current daughter of the house, at Exton, and a cousin of Janet's mother. The girls shared that Theodosia and Victoria, they shared many interests, especially in carrying out the charitable roles that went with their social status. Can you have the next slide, please? Um, where with their social status, and most especially in that context, anything to do with teaching and education for children in their respective villages and the surrounding areas. Both visited sick and poor villagers in their home villages of Exton and Cottesmore, and taught Sunday school. Theodosia writes especially of her experiments in Sunday school teaching, and what is very striking about their letters is their sincere and fervent Christianity. In 1857, just before Janet's birth, Theodosia wrote to her friend about her experience of teaching. May God use me in this thing, which was teaching and reading to the poor. May he use me to his glory. Oh, I do so long to be nothing but just to be used by him. Oh, Vicky, how blessed to be able to lose sight of oneself and to have no will but his. She'd never been to a convent school or anything. She just got this somewhere. I had my girls, that's her pupils, on a Sunday, and I had a happy time with them. Our Heavenly Father was near. Oh, that he may be working deep in their hearts to his own glory. Their letters of the 1850s and 60s are full of such earnest spiritual aspirations. Victoria confided to Theodosia that she longed for God to give me something to do and dreamed of forming a little society of those who love God and to settle in a large town devoted to doing good. Theodosia, age 17, and struggling with bereavement after a sudden death of a beloved elder brother, wrote in a similar vein to her friend, I feel as if a nunnery would be pleasant for a little. I know it is very foolish. Don't tell. <laughs> they were both very secretive about their religious life aspirations. Um, but actually, there was a whole movement within the Church of England at the time of young women forming Anglican sisterhoods. Uh, so they were in touch with that, and I think would have loved, for at least for a while, to have gone and tried it out. Theodosia experienced her relationship with God as a very personal relationship with Jesus, in which the latter was closely involved in the humdrum events of her life. 
of specific interest is a letter in which she describes being thrown by a horse. And as she rubs her bruises, she is suddenly overwhelmed by a sense of God's providence and of Christ's teasing reassurance. He said, so you see, I do look after you, Dodi writes, and I can't tell you how delicious it was, such an intense feeling of Christ's ever-present watchfulness. No presence, only I can't express it, as if he meant to, me to hear, why do you ever doubt my watchful presence with you? Don't think me very irreverent, Vicky, for speaking like this. Only I can't tell you what I felt in a more reverent way. I am struck by how closely sometimes Janet's own language and attitudes closely mirror those of her elder sister. For example, she writes in very similar words to Catherine Ashburnham in a letter that we had in the display, wondering if the latter's spiritual trials are not, being li are not like being thrown by her pony, Chips. After which, Janet imagines, Catherine would jump up laughing and she would like it. Her joy in the discovery of the call to mine in the vein of spiritual things echoes Theodosia's comment in another letter to Victoria, who had shared an account of a delightful evening Bible reading with her fiancé. There is nothing, says Theodosia in response to this, in which earthly help and communion is so sweet and strengthening as in the things of God. And I'm sure it will be so with you, my darling pet, and it makes me so happy to think of that. Finally, the atmosphere of evangelical faith would have made itself known to Janet through stories of and encounters with her remarkable relatives on her mother's side who were noted in indifferent ways for their earnest, active, indeed tireless work for the poor in one way or another. There are, in some of Canon Stewart's homilies, striking vignettes of the kind of suffering his flock would have been familiar with directly or to remove, of abject poverty, untimely death, of war, of chronic illness. But in his sermons there's no sense that the structures of society were partly responsible for creating these conditions. Removal of injustice or improvement of material circumstance was seen primarily as a means to enable individual conversion. So um, soup kitchens were a charitable action that kept people going long enough so they had time to see Jesus as their personal saviour, however poor they were. A good Christian must respond to God's love by living out his or her moral duty to himself and to others in every detail of life and on a day-to-day -day basis in the sphere into which God had placed them. It's a very different view to our own. For the women of the leisured classes, there was an interesting and often creative and freeing tension between the expectation to remain as angels in the house privately good in a private sphere, and the expectation that they should be active in promoting works of charity that often spilled into the public sphere. Georgian and Victorian expectations of upper-class women's domestic duties and responsibilities as hostesses had to be confined or, sorry, combined or preferably refocused and permeated by practical endeavours to improve the lot of the poor, visiting the sick or imprisoned, evangelizing the illiterate or the fallen, and actively supporting or driving forward various more ambitious social works, always in tandem with like-minded male politicians and clergy. We have seen this play out in the lives of Theodosia and Victoria. The latter, especially, became an active patron of the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, and the Mother's Union, founding branches in London and in Australia, where she later lived, and indeed all her married life, in spite of being crippled with osteoarthritis and having 13 children, she actively supported the liberal and reform causes 
espoused by her husband, the MP Fowl Buxton, who was son of one of the founders of the anti-slavery abolitionist movement, and was also, for a short period of time, governor of New South Wales in Australia. Janet's great-grandmother, Lady, next one please, Lady Diana Noel, was the matriarch of the family on her mother's side. And it was her influence on her 18 children, one of them Janet's great uncle, the future first Earl of Gainsborough, another Janet's grandfather, the Vicar of Exton. Um, it was this lady that created, who created the evangelical character of the extended family. Lady Diana was a remarkably free-spirited person. She was intensely religious, and at the same time, there was a slight whiff of scandal about her. <laughs> Separating later in life from her husband, she travelled round the country with alone, with a few servants, and her Calvinist chaplain, and settled in the Gower Peninsula in Wales. Yay! <laughs> Welsh connection at last. <laughs> Here, she founded and supported Lady Barham's Connection, six Presbyterian chapels with associated free schools. A biographical note in the DNB, the Dictionary of, of National Biography, describes how on Sundays she would be carried across the Gower Peninsula in a sedan chair by two flunkies. You can imagine them with their periwigs and their coattails to the nearest of her chapels, where she would be installed behind the pulpit in a special room with its own fire. Here she could toast her toes, hear and see the preacher whom she had appointed in comfort, and slip away unnoticed when she felt she had heard enough. <laughs> well, there are lots of doors, but I can't do the, I can't do the fire and the secrecy. Many of Diana's 18 children distinguished themselves in some evangelical pursuit. Baptist Risley was not the only, though he was the most famous churchman among them. His brother Gerard was also well, a well-known evangelical, an energetic and anxious preacher against the rising tide of secularism. Another brother, Charles, Janet's great-uncle, served for a time as a diplomat and visiting the exiled Napoleon on Elba, this is astonishing, he left behind a popular evangelical tract entitled, fittingly, The Dairyman's Daughter, <laughs> for the defeated emperor to read. For, he wrote to Janet's grandfather, I had no opportunity of saying anything on the great subject, that is of, of Jesus, which would make him happier even in Elba than he ever was on the throne of France. How vain is human happiness, my beloved brothers. Oh, let us seek a crown which is unfading, and so sit with Jesus on his throne forever. This was to his brother Leyland, Janet's grandfather, and as the letter was from one brother to another, there is no reason to suppose its religious sentiments were anything but sincere. <laughs> if Charles was to have his way, Jesus' throne would be crowded with knolls. <laughs> Baptist Charles, Gerard and Leyland had a sister, Louisa, whose daughter was Mary Jane. And Mary Jane was one of those, we see her here, who was marshalled by her, uh, Canon Stuart to try and persuade Janet not to be a Catholic. She had many, met, she is an outstanding woman, another book to be written about her. <laughs> Among other things, she was constantly pamphleteering people and setting up prayer groups all over England and also all over the world to pray for various causes, including the failure of Vatican I. <laughs> she, had, uh, she held prayer meetings in the laundries and the sculleries of her great houses. She had several stately homes all over England. Um, and what I like is she uh, called the servants together to pray in an informal way, as she called it, to wait on God, attractively, preferring that to more exhortation. She founded a missionary school in India, 
She uh, worked with Florence Nightingale and set up a, nurse, a home for nurses in Charlotte Street near the Middlesex Hospital. And on her deathbed, she was horrified when someone un unsensitively read to her the stories of the Jack the Ripper murders, which were happening at the same time. <laughs> but she, um, she rewrote her will, to uh, even on her deathbed, to found a, friend, a girls' friendly society to help the prostitutes in that area. So Janet was a member of a family of strong, independent men and women who were not afraid to contravene social expectations to stand out from the crowd in their religious faith um, and who also try to respond to the social needs about, around them. All of these are ways that they influenced Janet. Her own life was some, in some ways much tamer than her relatives. Before she visited the poor and the indigent in hospitals and workhouses, the step of entering the society was certainly adventurous and risky, but it didn't involve her in some of the risks that um, it had involved some of her relatives. You can see I'm, I'm skipping here. Um, but um, more importantly than all those good works was the way her evangelical upbringing influenced her in instilling into her heart the conviction that her faith had to be alive in the sense of being a living, convinced relationship with a personal God that was allowed to modify one's choices in life and one's way of living them. It prepared her in this way to be open and retentive to the Catholic expression of these truths that she had first heard from her older convert friend Harriet Ross and later from Father Galway. She might never have thought of herself as evangelical and had consciously cut herself off from her evangelical roots. But she was a product of its spirit and brought its spirit with her into the society to our lasting benefit. Amen. Amen.